me proceed to Javi Redondo's talk. And <clears throat> okay. so he will talk about the about the, the, the simulations, so to say. Uh, so thank you organizers for the opportunity of, of talking about quarks. Uh, I was actually looking forward to this uh, opportunity, even if uh, in, in presence rather than uh, online, but uh, okay, here we go. Perhaps the uh, next time we'll be, we'll be in, uh, yeah, in presence. So the title of my talk is Action Dark Matter Simulations in the, uh, I wanted to, uh, to tell you um, uh, a few insights on the, uh, possible implications of action dark matter in the post-inflationary scenario, and how have we dealt with them with uh, action dark matter simulations, with numerical simulations. <clears throat> so let's go. Yeah. So this is the outline, uh, well, uh, the, the, the setting of the stage. Uh, the most important thing uh, to understand this talk is, uh, or the bottom line, is that action dark matter is, is very different. It can have a very different substructure and, uh, and therefore, pure gravitational tests of, of uh, dark matter can be a smoking gun of uh, the nature of dark matter and the existence of axons. And I think this is particularly very interesting because axons are so weakly interacting that it's taken us decades to find them directly <clears throat> as dark matter or as uh, uh, emitted from the sun or in a laboratory. Uh, so this is a complementary uh, approach to find uh, both uh, the identity of dark matter and the existence of axons and possibly uh, so resolution of the strong seek problem, right? So uh, the topic is really, really vast. Already we have seen uh, many things, thanks to Jen, and, uh, and we heard uh, uh, more things from um, uh, David Marsh. Uh, but, uh, but here I'm I really, I'm going to focus on the QCD axiom, and in particular also on the post-inflationary scenario with uh, uh, n equals one, because um, yeah, it's much more easy, it's much easier to do uh, quantitative predictions uh, in this scenario, where there is only one uh, CP conserving uh, minimum. So in this scenario, and the most important thing is that in principle, uh, the action dark matter mass uh, can be predicted. The action dark matter mass is the the mass that QCD actions have to have in order to uh, account for the full amount of dark matter observed. Okay, and this has been done more or less successfully uh, in the different works. Uh, the most recent estimates, you have them here, uh, which were more or less in the tens of microelectron volts until recently, uh, Borghetto, Villadoro, and Hardy, uh, they came up with a, uh, with, uh, with a new idea, with a new uh, um, estimate that was slightly higher and they will have uh, different implications. But more or less this fixes uh, the typical scales and the typical cosmology of action dark matter in the post-inflationary scenario that looks more or less like this. Um, so let me guide you from the beginning of times until today, <clears throat> uh, looking at uh, the evolution of the dark matter field. The story might begin uh, at a uh, very high redshift when uh, the action becomes uh, actually a propagating degree of freedom, uh, an effective particle. Uh, and this might be below uh, the so-called Pacheco phase transition that might happen maybe at a redshift 10 to the 25 or so. This is pure speculation. Uh, and uh, if there was a period, period if there was a period of primordial inflation, that should have happened before this, this, uh, this moment in order to have the so-called post-inflationary scenario. Well, from that moment on, so the action field is created and uh, uh, the action field seeks to relax to its minimum, but it cannot do so very efficiently because it's an angular degree of freedom and the topological effects are, are born in this phase transition. In particular, cosmic, in particular, cosmic strings. So uh, this cosmic string and network evolves uh, due to certain scaling properties that we are to uh, investigate. And these uh, strings are our first uh, very interesting uh, substructure property of, of that comes uh, from, from axons, right? Well, uh, in, in units of redshift, this uh, spans a huge amount of, of redshift, of epochs until more or less uh, we reach the, uh, the history or, or the time in the evolution of the universe in which the uh, temperature is such that the uh, QCD, uh, that QCD becomes a, a confinement, uh, becomes confining, okay? So now quarks and gluons are combined into mesons and so on. Uh, and at the same time, or, or slightly, even slightly after, yes, 
slightly before, sorry, the topological susceptibility of QCD becomes so uh, relevant uh, and uh, is actually responsible for giving uh, the, for providing the accent with a mass that uh, it singles out the one particular value for the, for the vacuum of the accent, which is theta equals zero. Uh, and in that case, <coughs> essentially all the, all the, the, uh, the accent field in all the universe will go, will tend to go to zero. Uh, there will be uh, domain walls created that will dis uh, destroy uh, the, the leftover strings until here, and uh, all what well, will be left will be essentially accent field after uh, more or less this time. Uh, and uh, but we see that shortly after, and because the the accent potential is, uh, is periodic, it has self interactions, and in these self interactions, uh, some uh, very <clears throat> interesting lumps of action dark matter self uh, uh, perpetuating uh, at least uh, for, for a given amount of, of epochs appear, which are the so-called accidents. I think christened by, uh, by uh, our colleague Igor uh, Katja. And uh, so yeah, these accidents appear here and they have a minimal role, but they are the most relevant structures after the domain walls and cosmic streams have uh, dis disappeared. Uh, and uh, they are more or less predicted to last until the topological susceptibility becomes a constant. And then these uh, uh, accidents will essentially, because they are unstable, they will decay. And they will only leave some traces of uh, in, in the action of matter density. And from that moment on, the, the action field uh, is just uh, more or less uh, frozen at all scales. Uh, and there's only a very small free streaming of the wavy a pattern that action dark matter uh, had due to all these substructures. Uh, and uh, this uh, free streaming will last forever, would last forever. Oh, uh, and, uh, if it weren't for the fact that at some point, uh, yeah, the, the action dark matter would dominate the energy density of the universe and would be unstable under gravitational collapse. This happens around, has to happen around mass radiation equality in order to satisfy all CMB observations. Uh, which is rated around uh, yeah, uh, 4,000 or so. And in that, uh, in that case, the, um, uh, over -density, well, the, the fluctuations in the dark matter density, which are of order one in this scenario, will lead to a very prompt uh, uh, collapse of uh, fluctuations in what's called axial mini clusters, also described by Ivo Katjev in, in a lot of detail. And since that moment on, so these mini clusters, which form very promptly, they will be uh, suffering from hierarchical uh, mergers uh, into clusters of mini clusters uh, until at some point uh, uh, they grow up to the size of, of galaxies. And, uh, and in that, uh, at that moment, we are facing, uh, we are asking the question, so what are the implications? So what, what, all, what are the uh, signatures of all these uh, small, small scale structure, uh, um, structures that appear in action dark matter. Can we uh, detect now today something that was imprinted uh, in this very particular history? And uh, the answer is uh, yes, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, so we will, we will study this a little bit uh, more in detail. So the first uh, structure that I described was the, were the cosmic strings. These cosmic strings, <coughs> which are very complicated to simulate because um, uh, they uh, typically, so the, thickness, the physical thickness is inverse uh, axon decay constant, and the typical separation is uh, inverse Hubble time. And so the hierarchy between these two scales can be something of the order of 10 to the 30 in, uh, at the latest stages of our simulations. So these are very complicated, but they are very relevant, very important to, to simulate. <clears throat> so these uh, cosmic strings, they produce the axions that contribute to dark matter. So they produce axion waves, uh, that will become non-relativistic and then uh, axions. Um, and uh, so they are going to determine to some extent the axon dark matter spectrum at the epoch of, of QCD, uh, so uh, of the QCD phase transition when the axons become non-relativistic. You can see this in this simulation, in which you see a 2D slice of the theta angle, so the axon field uh, between minus pi and pi. Uh, and uh, you see, that the cosmic strings in this 2D simulation are these points which have all colors, which are, uh, yeah, you, you will see them as the endpoints of these uh, 
little uh, white snakes, okay? Uh, so here, and uh, when this cosmic stream, so for instance, this would be a loop that is collapsing here. And when this loop collapses, it produces a burst of axions that move outwards. And all these uh, features, these wavy light features are uh, axions that are radiated, obviously, by the collapse of, of string loops in this scaling regime, okay? Uh, so this is the way uh, the action uh, is the action spectrum uh, of dark matter is going to be determined. In this uh, new simulation, uh, you have uh, so I'm going to show you a projection plot of, of the action energy density, and here the spectrum of axions in, in the right. Uh, if all goes well, yeah. So you see how the spectrum is growing, and the the so as as the network becomes more sparse, the, the low frequency cutoff also is is uh, decreasing. Uh, because more and more low frequency actions are produced. And here we have very interesting oscillations. So this is the way in which the dynamics of the, of the strict network uh, scaling regime determines the, the, the spectrum of actions that we will have to inject at the GCD phase transition. Uh, the second uh, very interesting uh, type of, of uh, structures are uh, the so-called axitons that sometimes, uh, so they, are, they belong to the same family than dense axon stars and dilute axon stars. So maybe just uh, even if I had, uh, a lot has been already said and not much more I, it would be added from, from my point of view, I wanted to introduce uh, very briefly. So uh, just to, to make the difference. Um, so here uh, I would say, so the axitons are the, these, uh, so the breathers of the axon field in, in the early universe, uh, caused by the fact that the, that the axon field has a sign Gordon or follows the sign Gordon evolution in the expanding universe. Uh, but uh, the, it is a sign Gordon equation with, a, with an axon mass, and so the coefficient that multiplies the sign, which grows very fast in time. So uh, what you see here is that uh, the breathers are produced, and as a function of time, they shrink because the mass is increasing. So the, the, the radius is decreasing and uh, very interesting things happen. So they of course radiate axions. So they pulsate the radiate axions and uh, more and more are created in this atmosphere of, of large oscillation. So they, they reproduce and replicate somehow. And they dominate the, the power spectrum of fluctuations as I will show you. And they are potentially the highest density seeds in the arcs and dark matter. Uh, but at some point they will uh, become unstable. So they are, these axitons, they live more or less in this radius and mass scale. They live in this line, uh, this line. Uh, so in time, so first axitons become, uh, they might exist around here and then they decrease, they decrease, they decrease. And when the topological susceptibility saturates, they are more or less, they have this typical size, which is uh, unstable. Because this collapses with the so this coincides with the so-called uh, sorry dense action star uh, branch of the radius mass diagram, uh, and this is where yeah where action masses are, are stable. This and then the universe is not expanding. These uh, lumps, these um, so the breathers are uh, unstable, and uh, so I think we will have more about them uh, later. And uh, then we have also these dilute action stars, uh, which sometimes are called oscillotons, which are uh, the gravitational uh, coherent, uh, gravitationally bound coherent lump of non-relativistic actions. They have nothing to do with sine Gordon or, or self interactions. So they are only bound by gravity. And uh, we have already heard uh, a lot about them from, from Jens. They would be around here. They would be much, much uh, bigger. And uh, so I will not, go much more in detail, but they can be, of course, as, as Jens has said, they, they can appear very nicely in the uh, centers of, of uh, mini clusters. So um, much more on this uh, will be described uh, by Joshua in, in this, af this afternoon's talk. So just stay, stay tuned. So the third uh, substructure that I've mentioned is the, are just the, the axon mini clusters. And these are uh, the gravitational bound uh, axon dark matter halos that turn out to have a very small mass and a relatively uh, large density, essentially the density of the universe of matter radiation equality. And uh, they can be <coughs> leading to a micro, so they, they could be searched with micro or frontal, lens, frontal lensing. 
and uh, they can have a, a, a potentially very nasty uh, implications, which is that if uh, most of the dark matter is in these very small pieces of, of, of these uh, very small uh, bound halos, um, then uh, only a, a little amount of dark matter could be in between them. And this is the only one, that this is the only dark matter that we might um, be able to, to detect in our dark matter experiments down at Earth. So it's very important to know uh, how many of them of these objects are there, and how much dark matter is outside of them? Um, yeah. So here you have the typical cartoon that we have at the moment. Is that maybe the distance between between these mini clusters can be of the order of uh, thousand astronomical units or so, and this might lead to uh, encounters of mini clusters with the Earth here in the galaxy uh, at uh, every something like uh, hundred thousand years. So this might be a disaster if all the dark matter would be uh, collapsed in these objects. So <clears throat> then, um, so we, it is clear that from looking at this, uh, uh, these structures, it is very interesting that we can actually identify a uh, um, substructure of the active dark matter field that, uh, as I was telling you, can be a smoking gun. But then uh, a few uh, quantitative issues uh, are uh, raised, right? So what is the mini class of mass fu uh, function? that we will need to, to compute uh, microlensing events. Um, how are mini cluster density profiles also very important. Um, what are the dilute action star mass uh, functions? So how, how many dilute action stars do we have? Uh, and uh, if dilute action stars collapse and then uh, produce, um, so they become dense action stars and produce some burst of actions. These actions can also be detected perhaps, or they can be, uh, yeah. Uh, some some of these stars can can be burst in can can burst into um, photons that could be affected as well. Um, so then it's clear that uh, we need a distribution of action dark. Well, in order to answer these questions, for me it was very clear that we need to to uh, to know the distribution of action dark matter at uh, scales uh, at the scales when action dark actions become non relativistic uh, to just be able to simulate. The, the actions becoming non relativistic and the power spectrum at this particular, uh, the characteristic scales that uh, appear there. Then we need to simulate the gravitational collapse of these action dark matter fluctuations to study the, the mini clusters. And um, we might, so in order to answer the, what is the dilute action star mass fraction, mass fraction, we need to know this not only at, at the typical scale of the horizon when actions become non relativistic L1, the characteristic of scale of action dark matter, but also at smaller scales, okay? And we might do also uh, fast dark matter simulations at these very small scales as Jen, as Jen was already uh, pointing at. Uh, and then we need to study uh, the above mm, and uh, we need, uh, so for, to answer what is the rate, rate of uh, uh, dilute action stars collapse, we might need uh, all the above plus accretion rates and collapse simulations. So um, there's only a bit of all this uh, done. So, but uh, our first step was uh, to know the distribution of action dark matter at the uh, main scales. And this we have attacked with uh, the, um, numerical simulations of the uh, global uh, cosmic string network, which is essentially uh, simulate the evolution of a complex scalar field with, uh, with a uh, Mexican hat potential and an action uh, turn that essentially produces a tilt in the potential and uh, favors the CP conservative minimum that would be theta equals zero. So we, we prepared uh, an amazing uh, code to do uh, these simulations in supercomputers and, and this code is actually publicly available and we, have, uh, we are working now in the manual so that everyone can use it uh, more easily. Uh, so this allowed us to, to do simulations uh, up to essentially 10, 10 to the four uh, grids, uh, 10 to the four cube grids, uh, and uh, which is, uh, I think, the, the highest resolution that everybody has uh, achieved so far uh, in for many, uh, many applications. And uh, there, with these simulations, we could follow uh, essentially from the scaling regime up to uh, the production of accidents uh, very nicely. So instead of sh describing this, let me just uh, make show you a movie. So how, how the, one of these simulations might look like. I'm putting a lot of movies uh, in honor to Igor Kachev that always uh, likes, likes them so much. 
So I prepared a whole uh, lot of, of, uh, of them for you. So this would be a typical uh, simulation. So here at the very early times you have the scaling regime, cosmic strings are just um, uh, annihilating in loops and so on. But then uh, when the axon mass becomes non-relativistic, uh, domain walls, oh, domain walls appear uh, that have, so you see uh, very big voids appear here. And so what we see is the, is the projected uh, logarithm of the, the density contrast. So very nice voids appear in red. And here in yellow, you, you start to see the domain walls, okay, that uh, start to acquire some tension. The tension of the domain walls is increasing in time and is producing the collapse of all the, all the strings and producing these very uh, fine relativistic axioms. And uh, in the densest regions of the, uh, of the simulation, these dots appear, which are nothing but uh, axiotons. So if we look at the power spectrum, which was one of the, of the things that we wanted, or the, the thing that we wanted to study primary, primarily. Um, and so, <clears throat> the power spectrum shown in the dimensionless variance form, we, have, we, we can distinguish these three very nice uh, epochs, the early times with the scaling regime, uh, then we can uh, see how the domain walls um, start to uh, pop up uh, and uh, kill the, the cosmic strings. So uh, when, when we have strings, we have plenty of power at very small scales. This is the typical things of a string here. So essentially the power is just huge. So the contrast is huge, but due to the strings. And then when the domain walls are destroying the strings, uh, the power here decreases but you get some power at the typical size of the domain walls and the axitons, which is the inverse axion mass. And what we found is that uh, more or less, <coughs> importantly, at large scales, the power spectrum was very nicely uh, um, uh, converging to a value, okay? But at high frequencies, the, the, the spectrum which was continuing to evolve, essentially having a peak at the axion mass all the time that was moving towards a higher uh, mode, just because the axial mass is increasing in time. So this is what we call the axial of peak and is due to the random presence of, uh, or not so random presence of axions, uh, axitons in our, in our grid. Uh, but the important thing is that the, the, low, the large scale, the, the large scales actually showed uh, relatively good convergence in our simulations. Oh, so. so we had to do something because we, so, the problem with uh, the axitons is that at some point they become so small that uh, they, they will have, um, they will suffer very strong from uh, um, from a finite density, uh, finite or oh, discretization effects, right? Mm -hmm. So at that moment we didn't have uh, AMR simulations, uh, and so we had to do something. We cannot simulate them very clearly, so we had to uh, try to understand what was going to happen with them. And then we found out, so we, we argued that actually, so these axitons, they stay more or less localized and, um, and they, uh, they become smaller, they radiate some relativistic axions. And then at some point when the topological system really desaturates, they will disappear. Uh, so then what we did was just essentially uh, allow all the axions in, uh, in an axiton to radiate as soon as we couldn't, couldn't uh, simulate, it, simulate them properly. Uh, and um, we showed that the amount of axons that uh, the, the axons radiate at the, la uh, at, at the last time of our simulations, when we have to do this, is negligible. So we are not changing very much uh, the, the action or the, the, the density fluctuations at large scales by doing so. Uh, but we could just uh, essentially allow all axons in axitons to free stream. Uh, and this is uh, what we did here. So we did, uh, we did in a WKB fashion. So essentially we allow the axons to evolve with the linear equation instead of, of the sine Gordon equation. And then you see that more or less large scales are completely unaffected by the axitons that were very high density points here, they have more or less disappeared, but not completely. So here you see that there are some uh, high density points uh, they continue to, to exist here. And what you see here is that from the power spectrum that had this very high peak, essentially after performing this WKB um, uh, diffusion, uh, the spectrum goes back, goes to a, a power law that de decreases with momentum, but large scales uh, are unaffected. And very interestingly, this uh, high part of the spectrum corresponds essentially 
to the spectrum that we would have computed from the axiom spectrum. So this is the uh, density, so the spectrum of density fluctuations, remember. Um, but if we take the axiom spectrum, so the spectrum of axiom weights, and just uh, multiply it, essentially, um, yeah, multiply it by two and compute the, uh, the power spectrum, assuming that the, uh, the waves, the axiom waves are uncorrelated, we get essentially this uh, green part. So essentially at high frequencies, the accents are, they behave like an uncorrelated um, um, gas. So or the, the fluctuations behave as those of an uncorrelated accent gas, which is probably because we uh, allowed this free streaming. So we suspect that we have killed uh, some uh, interesting correlations because there are some oscillations here. So yeah, so this high energy part is still uh, very much uncertain. But the low energy part, I think we are pretty safe to be we described very nicely in our simulations. So armed with this final, oh, with this uh, results, we could actually uh, proceed to the next stage of our, of our quest and study gravitational formation of action mini clusters. Uh, so we did, of course, the, the free streaming uh, until uh, more or less uh, well, a few defaults before matter rotation equality. And the idea is very simple. So we take our discrete density field, uh, and then we just uh, decide to sample uh, it with particles. As uh, James told you, uh, told you before, this is justified because of the, the, the probability wavelength is going to be very small, at least to study the large scale uh, part of our simulation. And then we proceed with, uh, with n embodied simulation codes. Like for instance, in, in this, um, in this uh, movie, I used gadget 2 and here you see the projected density field uh, as a function of redshift. And uh, just like in standard um, uh, gold dark matter hierarchical oh. structure formation, you see a hierarchical pr uh, process in which essentially when, um, yeah, let's see, let's go a little bit before. Uh, you don't see very much uh, until uh, we start <clears throat> Uh, getting very close to matter gradation equality, so a factor of of, uh, of uh, ten or hundred uh, before you start to see how the cores of future mini clusters start to collapse. So you see here these small structures, <clears throat> and very soon, uh, by the epoch of matter gradation equality, you see that uh, uh, some mini clusters have already uh, formed, as you well, as you would imagine. And this is slightly after a multi-dimensional quality. And so this is slightly after recombination. You see that many clusters have already formed very nicely as smooth halos, but they still have some substructure. So this, this kind of simulations with Gadget 2 were not very uh, satisfactory. And uh, teaming up with, uh, with the, uh, the group of gents in Göttingen, we actually, and with uh, Klaus Dolak in, in Munich, we actually uh, made uh, this business much better. So we did a, a fantastic simulation of uh, 1 billion particles in a very large box uh, of uh, 21 uh, fundamental uh, units of length because we wanted to have as many mini clusters uh, as possible. A typical size of a mini cluster would, would uh, oh, a typical cube of L1, size L1 would give you a few, a few mini clusters, so we'd produce a few mini clusters. And we wanted to have uh, as many as possible uh, also to avoid non-linearities at the end of the simulation. So we uh, prepared these initial conditions. We ran them with Gadget 3 and uh, Super MOOC, and uh, we studied the, the evolution of the, of the power spectrum that we saw before, right? Um, this was uh, actually the power spectrum without particles in, in blue. And when we sampled it with particles, we, we got a very fine uh, sampling at high, uh, so at low momentum at large scales, but of course, there's some uh, white noise appearing at, at the very small scales. Again, something that tells us not to believe uh, our simulations at the very high, uh, at, the, at the smallest of structures. And then as time evolves, this uh, the formation of mini clusters produces this increase of, of power in the power spectrum, which is to be expected. And uh, <clears throat> due to the finite size of the simulation, we cannot trust that there are no significant volume effects because we use periodic boundary conditions. So uh, volume effects are, are going to be very important uh, beyond uh, Redshift 100 or so. So we, there we had to uh, stop the simulation. And there we already saw this uh, beautiful picture that uh, James 
I showed us before, in which we had uh, these few mini clusters. But if we zoom at the largest mini cluster and, and essentially all other mini clusters, you see a lot of substructure inside. And these are because uh, clusters, they form this cluster of mini clusters hierarchy. So, um, yeah, again, so this is the uh, mini, yeah, this is one of the things that we wanted to, to obtain the uh, mini cluster uh, mass function. So the number of mini clusters per unit volume as a function of the axial mass. And um, here you see the, the results uh, of, uh, of the, late, the latest times. And uh, first of all, you see that uh, there are plenty. So compared with the traditional expectations of accents so, or mini clusters of a typical mass of 10 to the 11 or minus 11 or 10 to the minus 12. So what we have here is actually a, a continuous distribution um, that is actually um, uh, slightly tilted to a low, low, moment, low mass uh, mini clusters, but not reaching uh, a, a power law of a minus one that would give you a logarithmic distribution of the mass of the mini clusters. So still, the, the most of the mass is in, in the largest mini clusters in this distribution. <clears throat> but uh, when, when you count simply the number of mini clusters, the typical mini cluster will have a very small mass. So there are, uh, yeah, so this is one of the most important characteristics, lots of mini clusters of a very small mass. Um, and um, so this 10 to the 11 here, so if you look at the matter radius inequality, that might be around this uh, time to, uh, 2500, uh, you see that here there's a cutoff uh, here. Uh, this is the, the line at more or less 10 to the minus 11. So, uh, and this is, uh, the tip, I think, the typical, um, the typical, um, so according to the, to the estimates of gravitational collapse uh, in spherical symmetry, uh, the uh, upper density of value uh, psi would collapse at the redshift, which is given by uh, the redshift of equality times phi. So then more or less, uh, these uh, mini clusters are the ones that have phi equals one because they are collapsing or they have collapsed just at uh, matter reduction equality. So then we would say that the typical uh, mini cluster of 10 to the minus 11, it has also this uh, over density of only one or so. And those, um, uh, and those with the smaller masses, they tend to collapse before. So they typically are more, uh, more dense. So these are the, this is the typical 10 to the minus 11. You saw before that Jens was mentioning 10 to the minus 13 as another point, uh, and this, uh, is, uh, this is something else. I mean, yeah? just for your info, uh, 33 minutes have passed. No, really. Thank okay, you. so then I have to fly. Uh, okay, so I fly very, very fast. <laughs> so, um, very good. So uh, we also found that the, these mini clusters or the biggest mini clusters, they form NFW profiles uh, in agreement with all the um, simulations of uh, in, in da, um, uh, cold dark matter, um, but we don't know what happens with the smallest mini clusters. So these are, uh, so NFW is a reasonable fit for the clusters of mini clusters where we have a very nice uh, resolution. And the most important thing is that we found that uh, at redshift 100, uh, essentially 8% 8 8 of actions were bound in these small mini clusters. So uh, yeah, so this is a very uh, frightening number. Uh, so this uh, is, so our results have implications for, uh, for microlensing, for the searches of, of action that are with microlensing, but I think uh, David Ellis is uh, so talking after me is going to tell you a lot about it uh, later. So, and then I just wanted to mention before is uh, that uh, so our simulations are not the end of the story. Very recently, Viladoro, uh, um, Gorgeto, and Hardy, they have pointed out that uh, while studying the, the evolution of the, uh, of the scaling regime, they have pointed out that maybe um, uh, a very different, so the end of the scaling regime is very different uh, than, than we can simulate. And it might consist on very, very high amplitude action fields uh, that have built up due to the increase of, of cosmic strengths. And uh, if you have very high uh, field uh, action waves that even overthrow uh, 2 pi, right? And most of the, 
then uh, when the when the action field becomes active, then you have non-linearities. So, so the action potential is flat, uh, so essentially has zero force at zero to pi or pi, etc. So you are going to bend these waves, uh, producing uh, higher modes. Uh, so nonlinear effects are expected, and they are expected to uh, break low frequency accents into high frequency accents. And this is what they observed in the accent spectrum. But starting with a um, low momentum, so with a spectrum that has a peak at low K, uh, after evolution, you would get something like uh, a peak that is 10 times higher. So essentially you upscatter accents. I wanted to show you a nice movie of how this would look like. So you have here these domain walls, uh, oh, domain walls that form uh, and then uh, generate, oh, generate uh, high, uh, high energy accents for a relatively smooth uh, field configuration. And uh, oh, there are a lot of, uh, yeah, I have to fix this simulation. So um, what, we've, what we study also this, uh, this uh, effect, or we have studied this effect and we see that due to this uh, high, so this moving uh, actions to high, high frequencies, actually the, the fluctuations can be very strongly affected. And in particular, the uh, fluctuations on large scales can be quite decreased. But uh, okay, these are preliminary results. And the implications uh, of this uh, can be actually quite substantial because uh, if we decrease the power at low scales, then we will have much less mini clusters and smaller densities. And this means that they will uh, be much less and they will be much more easily disrupted in the galaxy. So it might, they might take this 80% and take it to uh, a few percent. So my conclusions, uh, are finally, that action dark matter uh, substructure offers uh, very interesting smoking guns to discover actions, but we need to understand quantitatively the power spectrum. And uh, so the scaling regime is, of strings is very relevant to set the initial conditions of uh, when action, the action dark matter field or when the action field becomes uncharacteristic in dark matter. And uh, so our first simulations with fluffy strings, they led to a very nice picture, in which we had these many low mass mini clusters, uh, no, essentially no large mass and large um, over density parameter mini clusters that were very atypical and uh, no micro density constraints as, as you will hear uh, more. Uh, and very large action dark matter bound fraction, which can be a problem for direct detections. However, uh, this is only the first simulations uh, that, uh, that we have done more consistently, and now we are exploring uh, more uh, different scenarios, more refined scenarios, like the scenario of Villarreal, Gorgetto, and Hardy, that can change this picture actually completely. Uh, and uh, yeah, more on that on the, hopefully on uh, the next quarks, because now is, uh, all is, is work in progress. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Xavi, for this uh, nice talk, uh, nice presentation, and also these uh, illuminating uh, movies, which uh, look looking really sometimes really frightening. <laughs> so uh, the first, uh, so Dima Dima Levkov has a, has some uh, okay. questions. Okay, Xavi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, you observe in simulations that the axitons, they are stable as long the, as the axion mass uh, increases, right? And they become suddenly unstable when it, the axion mass is constant. So uh, the question is, do you have a theoretical explanation, theoretical argument for that? Yeah, I, I, well, I outlined some argument in, in, in our paper. I'm not completely convinced. Uh, but uh, the, well, the the idea is that you can, if you have, if you have a given a lump of, of a given size, then um, if you study the amount of gravitational, sorry, the amount of self interacting energy or uh, gradient energy as a function of the amplitude, you see that there is a critical amplitude uh, about which self interactions are going to always win, right? If you have a given size, so um, so there's like a critical value of the field. And um, and uh, so what what we what I observed is that if the if you have one one lump that is uh, emitting axions and then uh, emits half of the energy, so it reduces the amplitude, but at the same time the mass is increasing, right? So you give a certain amount of time for this for this process, and then you check again where is the where is the critical, 
And then you see that if the topological susceptibility increases with an index that is larger than two, then once an axiton uh, is unstable, so one is, once is uh, overcritical and it's going to start producing radiation, then all its uh, daughters or uh, sons and daughters that lead afterwards, so they will always be super, uh, sub, subcritical. So yeah, that the remaining, uh, sorry, I'm getting into it. Um, the, the, the leftover lump will always be super, super critical and then it will be uh, always exploding. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so Sasha, uh, Sakharov, you have to- Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to mention about uh, gravitational lensing regime. Because 30 years ago, uh, Wamsgan suggested regime which is determined only with the mass of uh, gravitational lens. Microlensing means mass is around stellar masses, because in this case, angular resolution between images around microsecond. So, but if uh, your lens is much, uh, 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 let us say, smaller, so in this case, it, uh, it's, uh, you have to use another prefix here. It's uh, also, it's, it's something like remark, but also question. If you perform, your simulations, not only for axion dark matter, but simultaneously for uh, cold dark matter, conventional dark matter, will you we see some differences in these simulations by ice, for instance, with the same initial conditions, with the same problem? I'm sure that you know answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what was the question, uh, but um, so perhaps, okay, can you, can you formulate the question again? So I, I'm, I'm certainly for very small mass uh, objects, uh, you, you cannot use uh, the traditional- uh, um, No, it's just, just sorry, but for, for, long, for long question, but, but uh, 30 years ago, uh, Joachim Wabsgans introduced, let us say, terminology, classification of different regimes of gravitational lensing. Uh, standard lensing with a galaxy mass is around 10 to the 12 solar masses. In this case, angular resolution is around second. If you uh, use, let us say, mass, which is stellar masses, is uh, in, let us say, in two, 10 to the, uh, let us say, uh, uh, it's stellar masses. In this case, angular resolution between images is square root because angular resolution is, is depend on mass as a square root of mass. In this case, angular resolution micro arc second. If you wanted to search for planets, 10 to the uh, six solar mass roughly, in this case, you use nano regime. So it's all this terminology suggestion was ac accepted by the community. So that is, that is, uh, that is sense of a remark. Oh. But question was about simulation, about comparison of your simulation with conventional dark matter simulation. Because I'm sure that you started from probably from cold dark matter simulations. So the, the, it's very interesting. So there are no comparisons between our simulations and standard cold dark matter simulations because there are no standard cold dark matter simulations at these very small scales. Mm -hmm. uh, typical, standard, uh, typical standard cold dark matter simulations, they care about the, the, um, the adiabatic fluctuations of the inflaton uh, in order to study the large, the, the large scale distribution of galaxies, right? Uh, perhaps even dwarf, the dwarf galaxies, but we are talking about uh, parsec scales here. So oh, we are. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think there are no um, standard simulations at these scales. Um, uh, we apply. You know, so uh, that's the answer. So there, there are no comparison. I think that the dark, uh, the standard dark, uh, cold dark matter simulations would be quite dull at these scales. So they would be quite boring. Mm -hmm. uh, but you use like telescopes in your simulation. Okay, thank you. So there was there, there was a question by Dr. Kalpana Bora. Yes, yes you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have two questions. First question is that how to detect the, the very small masses of the axions, like say microelectron volt or maybe smaller than that. So how, how do we detect such small masses? This is first question. And second question is that, can the dark matter be composite of axions and scalars? Um, so, 
So how do, how do we get small masses? And this is because uh, the accent is a, is a Goldstone boson of a symmetry broken at a very high mm -hmm. scale. So it has a very high decay constant, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is, so the symmetry is broken explicitly by the anomaly of, I know, of QCD, by the color anomaly, which is uh, happens at a GV scales. So the ratio of these two scales gives you a small number of uh, milli electron volt, micro electron volt, depending on the on how high your action decay constant is. So it's kind of a CISO uh, kind of thing if you want, but it's due to the constant nature of the axon. How do we detect them? How do we detect them is a completely different business. So typically we, we, um, we do, we, we employ very different techniques than uh, the ones we employ for wind detection. Uh, and they're typically, uh, they involve the resonant conversion of these axon waves. So axon relativistic dark matter would be like a coherent oscillation of the axon field. And this coherence can be exploited to just drive one resonator in the lab. Uh, and uh, if, well, depending on what resonator you, you use, like a, a microwave cavity or um, there are other examples, then you can, you can, you could in principle detect this uh, small mass accents. I had, to, so I had talked about this two days ago. Yeah, so we had this uh, very nice talk. About Actions there. converting to uh, photons, I mean, and then cavities using to detect exactly. them. Yes. You can convert the uh, accents to photons or you can, yeah. um, you can let the axon field uh, oscillation drive uh, spin precession and detect uh, the spin precession with, uh, yeah, like you would detect, uh, uh, you, you, you would do, uh, you would use uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, to detect, um, to detect it. You can do all the all the few things, uh, but this is this is. A I, I think problem. this takes to, this this probably takes too long. Yeah. Uh, we have already. We are all. You had a, a third question, which I forgot. Sorry. So can the dark matter be a mixture of axions and scalar fields? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so um, axions are <laughs> scalars in a sense. So, uh, but bearing this, uh, the answer is yes. So, dark matter can be can be made of axions and many other things. Yeah. A very interesting thing to say is that uh, if actions exist, they are, they are, it's very difficult that they, that they are not dark matter, okay? So they might be a subdominant component, but if they exist, they will be dark matter for sure. Um, it's very hard to, to avoid. So then if there are other, if there's a wimp around in nature uh, that's also produced, then you can have also a mixed dark matter. Thank you. So Igor, Igor, you, you, you allow still for, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I think we should discuss. I mean, for, for me, it, it doesn't matter whether I get something to eat or not, but <laughs> for some others, may, maybe. So please. Harya, can you go to the slide with your final result? This, uh... yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> a little bit confused. if. Um, I look at the mini clusters with fixed mass. This time, uh, the number of them decreases. It yes. is just renormalization because the clusters of mini clusters form or they disappear somehow. I think that they, they are merging. So uh, in principle, this is an- They so really merging? They form clusters of mini clusters losing identity or yeah. yeah. So, they, so if I understand correctly, so be, because this plot was was made by uh, Benedict, but I asked him the same question, and uh, so in this, um, so in this uh, Halley mass function, uh, you have all the mini you have all the mini clusters. So even uh, there's there's sub mini clusters as well, and uh, therefore they don't lose. So when when they form a new mini cluster, you don't remove. So you create one mini cluster, but you don't remove the, the previous ones. So the ones that are decreasing is because they really are uh, merging in such a way that you cannot distinguish two of them. Uh, please check, it's important. Why is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, identity or merge and form larger, yeah? Okay. Yeah, I, I think this is like a, like a really key like thing that we don't completely understand here. 
the like what like what fraction are really merging and becoming less dense in the merging process and what fraction are like surviving within the clusters of mini clusters yeah but, because here it's like, there, there are different things right so you can you can merge two things so they gain mass and then they move outside but the, yeah that's it, exactly but they can become gravitationally bound and then they stay i think this diagram but then a new mini cluster is formed there uh, and uh, yeah, so we have not studied this, these things in detail. And Javier, uh, some frames from your movies are really beautiful. I think you can sell them. <laughs> I certainly want to have some of them framed in my wall, in my office. I will, I will, as, a, as a movie, as a movie or as one picture? Framed. <laughs> pictures. They, they... Framed in some frames and I maybe print. They yeah. remind me of this Kandinsky on my wall, on my wall here. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, maybe we nice. have to organize a, an art exhibition uh, of yeah. colors and sounds of action dark matter. So there's may maybe the last question by uh, Kushi Kuta. Hi, hi, Javi. Uh, ju just to get get some broad idea, if the universe was long time. Uh, matter dominated. Was the picture or, or, or the story is going to be changed in any way? Uh, yes. So, well, particularly if um, if uh, the QCD phase transition happens during uh, the dark matter domination. So, uh, well, I understand your your question in the following way. Let's assume that there is a period of matter domination in the history of the universe, and then something happens and then we go back to radiation domination and then the standard BBN happens, so, right? Yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, if this period of matter domination happens to um, contain the QCD phase transition and the moment when actions become non-relativistic, then this changes very much the, the characteristic sizes and time scales of, of the problem. And uh, typically you get to mini clusters which are uh, much, much bigger and more dense. So they are easier to, to uh, detect microlensing. Okay. So yeah. And that, thanks. We, we have so a let, paper on yeah. we have a paper on mi, uh, mini clusters in non-standard cosmologies. I will send you a link. Okay. Oh, I appreciate. It. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's thank uh, Xavi again. Yeah. And now, could you please unshare your slides so that we can proceed with the next talk? Thank you very much. Thank you.